Lesson for September the 18th is entitled, What Does Your Church Need? The key verse is 2 Peter 1, verse 3, which says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. The scripture is from Revelation 3, verses 1 through 22. The lesson focus, Christ will speak to churches that are willing to listen. In the overview, it says that each church in Revelation 3, like every local church today, had a unique situation and need. We will look at the particular problems facing these three congregations and the solutions Jesus provides. In the introduction, it says that sometimes God gives us exactly what we want. On other occasions, He ignores what we want and gives us what we need. As every parent knows, needs and wants are two separate things. God's word promises he will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. It doesn't say, however, that he will give us what we want. Our key verse reminds us that he provides everything we need for a godly life. This is true for individual believers as well as for local churches. Each congregation in Revelation 3 had specific issues. In some instances, they did not realize what they needed until Christ pointed it out. It's amazing how the concerns facing these first century believers are still major issues 20 centuries later. A prayerful look at the situations in Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea will reveal our own condition. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In part one, it says to the Sardis church, Wake up. And the text is from Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6, which says, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The couch potato Christians at Sardis had a reputation of being alive, but Christ declares them dead. What a sad indictment. This congregation had experienced glory days in the past. They had seen wonderful victories. Prayers had been powerfully answered. Lives had been radically transformed. But somehow, all the power had leaked away. All they had left was a pile of smoldering ashes where a fire used to burn. Over time, these believers had grown drowsy in comfort, and they fell asleep at their post. They neglected to tend the spiritual flame, and though they still looked good on the outside, they were dying on the inside and merely playing church. Today, many churches have the spirit of Sardis, focusing backward to the good old days and forgetting to live in God's will today. The Sardis church was called to wake up and strengthen what remains. The fire may be out, but there was still a few smoking embers left. Fan them into flame. There's nothing wrong with remembering victories of the past as long as they are reminders of how God wants to work in the future. Look backward to look forward. Strengthen what remains. In part two, it says, To the Philadelphia church, cheer up. 
The text is from Revelation 3, verses 7 through 13, which says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Down the road, thirty miles from Sardis, the struggling saints in Philadelphia suffered through very difficult trials. Circumstances beyond their control had left this small congregation floundering in discouragement. Maybe they wondered if God had abandoned them, but apparently God wanted to bring renewed strength and resurrection. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. God loves his bride, the church, too much to waste her struggles. Maybe the very source of frustration and discouragement is an open door to a brand new ministry. Disappointment is his appointment. God reveals his love and peace deeply when we walk through a valley. The Lord has a beautiful way of lifting us beyond the circumstance, helping us capture his vision for what he wants to accomplish in coming days. Are you heavy-hearted, discouraged? Has the road been all uphill lately? Have faith. Be faithful. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. In part three, it says to the Laodicea church, warm up. And the text is from Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22, which says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Forty miles from their brothers and sisters in Philadelphia, a congregation gathered in Laodicea. Located at the junction of three important roads, Laodicea became a center for commerce, administration, and banking. Compared to its sister churches, the Laodicean congregation was in excellent fiscal condition. Their fellowship was blessed with good business leaders, excellent fund balances, and quality resources. Yet a word of dire warning rang out to God's frozen chosen in Laodicea. Warm up or else. I know your deeds. 
that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. How did the Laodicean church end up in such a lukewarm condition? It certainly did not happen overnight. Lukewarmness creeps into our souls over a long stretch. We grow lukewarm when we take the kettle off the fire. At first, it's hardly noticeable, but a slow cooling occurs as time passes. When we love this world too much, our spiritual fervor subsides. The deceitfulness of wealth and comfort dulls our spiritual passion. The most dangerous place to live is not Iraq or the Gaza Strip. It is the comfort zone. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Yet the church at Laodicea was in dire need of the most important thing, revival. How sad to see a church with such potential merely going through the motions and failing to fulfill its mission. A Laodicean church is a self-satisfied church. Offerings are good. Attendance is good. Programs are good. Music is good. The sermons are good. But something important is missing. When you walk away from a church like that, you feel as if you've just eaten a half-baked microwave dinner. Yuck. For that reason, the Lord said he was ready to spit them out of his mouth. To a church that has lost its heart and central passion, Jesus provides the answer. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Often this verse is used to convince unbelievers to open their hearts to Christ. In context, however, it is directed to a church that has grown cold. And the best way to warm up a congregation is to open up and ask Jesus to come in and light the fire. As part of today's life application, think about the following questions. Do I see our church in one of the Revelation 3 congregations? What is the most pressing, specific need of our local body of believers? What is my part? How can I be part of the solution rather than the problem? <laughs>